In life, we all step up to the plate, hoping to hit a home run in our marriage, business, our family. What if the key was following a simple pattern? Four words, four life-changing principles. There's only one way to get power at the plate. Connect with God. Once you trust God, you're able to win battles within yourself. Securing your identity, winning relationships with others is next. Rounding third means winning results in whatever you do. Excellence matters. God created this game plan, a pattern different from the world, so that we can have the full life He intended. We're in a series called Home Run Life. I'm not just wearing a, uh, a baseball shirt just for the fun of it, though I do like the Cubs. Uh, we're in a series about baseball. And, uh, you know, all of us want to experience a home run life, right? We want to experience success. We want to win. We want to be able to be uh, successful in our relationships and in work and in uh, school and all those different areas of our life. And so uh, what we've found is in the scripture, uh, I believe that God shows us that he desires for us to have a home run life. And I believe there's a pattern that we can follow to be able to experience that. And we've been looking at that pattern over the last couple of weeks. Uh, The pattern or the analogy that we're using is a baseball diamond. And so in the first week, we started at home plate. At home plate, that's where the batter gets up and connects with the ball and is able to advance on. And we talked about that first week, how we need to connect with God. And the way we do that is by winning dependence. See, in a world that tells us that we need to be independent, we talked about how spiritual maturity is actually about becoming more and more dependent on God. Not independent from Him, but dependent from Him. So we start by winning dependence, and then we move to winning within. Last week we talked about character, and we talked about temptation that comes against us, and we need to win those battles of character, the battles against temptation. We need to win within. So today, we are looking at second base, and at second base is when we begin to win with others. We talk about community. In the game of baseball, when a player gets on second base, uh, it is said that that player is now in scoring position, because even if the next batter uh, hits a single, that, that, that runner on base, on second base, can, can typically or usually get around and score on that single that's hit. And in the same way for us, if we can have healthy relationships, if we can win with others, that can help us to be successful in life. It can help us to be sex- successful in uh, a community and in our relationships and at work. So today, we're going to discover what it means for us to win with others. I want you to just take a moment and think about one of the, your favorite memories from your life, one of the greatest moments, or maybe a couple of the greatest moments you can think of in your life. Maybe it was a time where you had the greatest joy, or you had the greatest meaning, or maybe it was a time where you just had a lot of fun. Now, I want you to think of the opposite. I want you to think of some of the most painful moments in your life. I I want you to take a moment to think of maybe a time where you experienced uh, the greatest disappointment or the greatest sorrow. Now, I haven't surveyed anybody in the room today, but I would imagine that both those uh, ends of that spectrum, the greatest memories and the most painful memories, I would imagine that both of those involve people. You know, our relationships with others are absolutely critical for us, and the strength and the health of those relationships can set us on a course for failure or set us on a course for success as well. And so it is absolutely essential that we learn how to win with others. So that's the question that we're trying to answer today. How do we win with others? Throughout this series, we've been looking at the life uh, of a man named Joseph, We saw in that first week, Joseph needed to learn to depend on God. Uh, Joseph was given a dream. It was a home run dream that he was going to be a great ruler and even his family were going to serve him. But we found in the very beginning of Joseph's story that God stripped him of everything. Everything that he would have depended on to be able to accomplish that dream because God needed Joseph to depend on him. 
And then last week we saw that Joseph had been sold into slavery. He went to work for a man named Potiphar in Egypt, a powerful man in, in, in Egypt. And Potiphar's wife was attracted to Joseph, and she kept propositioning him. She wanted to sleep with him, and Joseph won within, and he kept on denying those advances from her. Now, Joseph's story is one of the longer narratives in the Bible, and we don't have time to get through all of the particulars of it, but I want to give you just a couple highlights so we can all be on the same page today. Joseph is, uh, spurns the advances of Potiphar's wife, and so Potiphar's wife decides that she's going to get Joseph back for turning her down, so she accuses him of rape. And so Potiphar has Joseph thrown in the prison. Uh, Joseph uh, sits in prison where he works hard and proves his worth there. While he's in prison, he ends up interpreting the dreams of a couple of men, and those dream, the, the interpretation comes true. Later on, Pharaoh, the ruler, the top guy in all of Egypt, has a dream. And one of these men remembered Joseph, and they say to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, I know none of your wise men can interpret this dream, but I know a guy that was in prison with me, and he can interpret dreams. And he, his, his interpretation came true. You need, to, you need to find him. So Pharaoh gets Joseph and brings Joseph to court to meet with him. And Pharaoh tells Joseph his dream. Joseph prays and interprets this dream of Pharaoh. Pharaoh this dream that Pharaoh had, uh, the interpretation is that there are going to be seven years of plenty, seven years of a bountiful harvest, but then there are seven years of drought and famine that are coming. And Joseph says to Pharaoh, hey, that's the interpretation, but Pharaoh, let me just give you some advice. If I were you, what I would do is I would find someone who's really wise and have them manage all of the extra that you have, and then that way when the famine comes, you'll have food uh, that you'll have saved up and stored up. <laughs> and Pharaoh says, none of my wise men were able to tell me this dream or the interpretation, but you have. You're the most wise man I know, so I'm going to put you in charge over all of Egypt. You are my second in command. Only I am over you, no one else. I mean, this is a great turn of events from Joseph, being thrown into a pit by his brothers, uh, then going to prison, being falsely accused, going through all of this turmoil, all of these years, and now he is suddenly finding himself in the palace. Now, when we pick up our text today, What's happened is the seven years of blessing are over. In fact, we're two years in to the famine. And Joseph is going to, in our text today, he's going to reveal himself to his brothers. Uh, again, we don't have time to get into the particulars of it. You can find it in Genesis chapter 39 and beyond. But Joseph's brothers have visited to get food because all the surrounding nations are struggling with this famine. So the, Joseph's brothers have come. And they have gone, and now they are back at the second time. And it's at this second meeting that Joseph decides that he's going to make himself known to them. And so what happens here is really significant. What Joseph says to his brothers upon revealing himself to them shows us how we can win with others as well. He starts this way. The first way that we can win with others is by valuing others more than ourselves. By valuing others more than yourself. Genesis 45, 3 says this. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? I mean, think about this. The very first two things that he says to his brothers, he introduces himself, he reveals himself, and then he says, is my father still living? Now, if your brothers or sisters had taken you and they had thrown you into a pit... <laughs> and they had stripped you of your nice fancy robe, and they had sold you into slavery and treated you as though you were property, if you were going to reveal yourself to them years later, what would the first words be for them, <laughs> right? If it was me and I were Joseph, it would be something like this. I am Joseph, and I have a pit already picked out for you, okay? <laughs> I am Joseph, and I have a prison cell with your name on it. You made my life horrible, now I'm going to make your life horrible. Joseph doesn't even deal with any of that. Joseph doesn't deal with the past. He doesn't deal with his pain. He doesn't deal with the injustice that was done against him. The, the first question out of his mouth, he, he makes this statement, I am Joseph, is my father still living? 
Joseph's main concern in that moment, in the present, is not himself, but it's his father. It's others. And church, if we are going to win with others, we need to value others more than ourselves. This is a common theme all throughout the scriptures. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You see, our world says, value yourself first. But God says, value others first, even at your own expense. Our world says, look out for number one. But God says, no, you make other people number one. Our world says, fight for your rights, stand up for yourself. And God says, let go of your rights and stand up for others and fight for others. And that's what Joseph does. He doesn't concern himself with himself. He knows his father is old, he knows his father is frail, and so he makes sure that he asks about his father first. So if we're going to win with others, we need to value others more than ourselves. And second, we need to forgive what we can't forget. Now this is a tough one here for us, but we need to forgive what we can't forget. Joseph, it continues, it says this, but his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. So remember in the previous verse, all Joseph says is, I am Joseph, how is my father? And his brothers are dumbfounded by this. They're terrified, they're frozen in fear because of this. So Joseph has to repeat himself and clarify, I am Joseph your brother, okay, just, just to make sure you realize who I am here. I am your brother. And what Joseph does is absolutely, absolutely incredible. He breaks the cycle of hatred and retaliation. He breaks the cycle here of hatred and, and retaliation. Earlier on, Joseph's brothers hated him because he was their father's favorite. He gave them this fancy coat. He probably always spoke, why can't you be more like Joseph? He probably spoke highly of him. He was very clearly his favorite son. And so because they hated him so much, they retaliated against him. They sold him into slavery. They threw him into a pit. Joseph was sinned against, but Joseph here does not retaliate. He He is the second most powerful man in Egypt. One word One look at a guard that was with him, and these brothers of his were toast. No one would have even known. No one one in Egypt would have even cared. They wouldn't have known that they were his brothers. It would have just been like, okay, Joseph told us to get rid of these guys. We're going to do that. We're going to kill them. Joseph could have thrown them into a a pit. He could have put them in prison. He could have even made them his slaves. But instead, what does he say? He says, come close to me. Come close to me. Joseph closes the gap. And in this position of power, he would have stood at a distance from them. That might be why they don't recognize him. There was a a separation physically from them. Earlier uh, in the passage in the narrative, you, you find that they're eating together. And they actually ate at different tables. So there's some sort of a distance that was there. And what Joseph says is, there's not need for a distance anymore. Come close to me. And church, if we're going to win with others... We need to close the gap between us and others, and it's on us to do that. We are to forgive, and we are to forgive what we can't forget. It's our responsibility to take the initiative on this. In Matthew 18, Peter comes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus about this. He says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone? And Peter says, should I forgive seven times? And Peter's really trying to be magnanimous here. He's trying to show off a little bit because uh, the common teaching of the day was that you only had to forgive someone three times. And so Jesus, or Peter is he's just trying to you know, show off a little bit. Should I, should I forgive seven times? And Jesus says this in verse 22. He says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And what's the point here? The point is not counting how many times. The point is you don't stop. The point is you forgive and you forgive and you forgive and you forgive even if you can't forget. But you might say, Pastor Eric, what if they aren't sorry? You forgive them 
anyway. But Pastor Eric, what if they do it again? You forgive them anyway. But Pastor Eric, what if they haven't learned their lesson? You forgive them anyway. Pastor Eric, I don't feel like it. I don't like it. It's hard for me. Pastor Eric, they really wounded me. You forgive them anyway. You forgive and you forgive and you forgive. Why do we do this? Because that's what God has done and will do for you. Because last week, when you had that thought that you shouldn't have about that coworker or about that neighbor, and you asked for forgiveness, God forgave you. It's because last week, when you lost your temper and you blew your lid, God forgave you. When you had that, that nugget of gossip that you just couldn't hold on to and you told someone, God forgave you. He forgives, he forgives, he forgives. And so if we have experienced that forgiveness, and if we are going to win with others, we need to forgive as well. That's what Jesus has done for us. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were sinners, while we were sinners Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrated his love for us. Christ died for us over 2,000 years ago. That's, that's, that's before most of us were born, right? <laughs> right? Okay, all of us, right? We were, it was before all of us. That was a joke, and I wasn't sure if you, yeah, okay, you chuckled a little bit, right? That was a long time ago, but the point is, is he did that to forgive us, and that was before any of us were on the scene, and he did it anyway. So what's keeping us from forgiving those around us? Our responsibility is to extend that same forgiveness to others who sin against us. So we value others more than ourselves. We forgive what we can't forget. And then third, we give more than we take. Verses 5 through 7. Joseph continues, he says, And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. There is no doubt that Joseph has had a rough life up to this point being falsely accused, going from pit to prison, being mistreated. And now he finds himself spending his days talking to people from Egypt and outside Egypt, trying to help them by providing food, allowing enough food to go out so that people won't starve to death, but not giving too much food away that they won't make it through the rest of this famine. Joseph has spent all of this time dealing with all of these problems, and now he's dealing with the greater problem of this famine. Joseph knew that God had sent him to be a blessing. Joseph endured all of this in his life and was enduring this current struggle with this famine. He was put in this position of power not to take but to give. Joseph was put in this position to give and not take. And and church, if we're going to win with others, it requires generosity. It requires that we understand that we are not doing this for ourselves. We are giving more than we take. When you walk into a room that's filled with people, what do you think about? Do you think about what you can get from people or do you think about what you can give to people? The reality is, is so many of us, most of the time, we think about what we can get from people. And it sounds really selfish, and it is, but we do this. I mean, think about the end of service here. At the end of service, who do you naturally go and talk to? It's probably the same people each week, right? And you do that because of what you get from those people. You probably aren't consciously even thinking about it, but those people make you feel good. Those people are comfortable to you, and you go to them because you enjoy their company. You're getting something from them. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We need those kinds of relationships in our life. But what about those people who can't offer you anything? Do you think about them? Are they on your radar? I mean, maybe those people drain you a little bit. Maybe those people, you're always giving more than you're receiving from them. Do you have people like that in your life? If you're going to win with others, we need to be the kind of people that give more than we take. Outside in the foyer, we have four different values that are on our walls, that are in banners on the walls out there. And the one on the far right says, serve on it. And it has this phrase, it says, we give all that we have and all that we are Because Jesus gave everything for us. That's one of our values here at Cornerstone. This is what we do. We give more than we take. 
In just a couple of weeks, we're going to have our annual fireworks event that we do for our community. Now, I know that for, for us, it, it might be easier for us or more, des- you know, we might desire to just go be a part of the attendance at the fireworks event. But the value here at Cornerstone isn't just to go and attend that event. The value at Cornerstone is to serve. It's to give all that we have and all that we are because Jesus gave everything for us. So we are asking you to help us serve at that event. We are going to give more than we take from the community. And one of the ways that we do that is by giving a fireworks celebration for our community. This is a value that we have to have. And if we're going to win with others, if our church is going to win with others, we need to give more than we take from the community. So... We value others more than we value ourselves. We forgive what we can't forget. Third, we give more than we can take. And then last, we give control to God. Verse 8. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. You see, church, when we are faced with pain in relationships, and we're faced with trials and difficulties, we have a few different ways that we can respond. Uh, First, we can allow those who've harmed us to have control over us, right? You've seen people like this where they are restricted because of their past. They are are ruled over the pain or the sorrow or the, the difficulty of the circumstances that they've walked through. They give that other person power or control over them. Another option is that we can try to take control And whereas uh, the first option, we are restrained, in this option, what we do is we often try to exert revenge on the other person. We want to get back at them. We want to force some sort of punishment on them or some sort of realization on them. You see, revenge is a twisted kind of form of control. Social psychologist Ian McKee says, people who are vengeful tend to be those who are motivated by power, by authority, and by desire for status. They don't want to lose face. And so we can choose to be controlled by our past and by our circumstances, or we can try to exert control over those people who have hurt us, or what we should do is we should allow control and give control over to God. It's not until this happens that reconciliation can take place. It's not until this happens where we can have restored relationship with the person. And this is ultimately the goal that we have. As believers, as Christians, reconciliation should always be first and foremost in our minds. Now, whenever I talk about reconciliation, and we talk about forgiveness, I, I need to take a moment, can take a sidestep here, and just acknowledge that there are some really extreme cases of violence and uh, like domestic abuse and those kinds, reconciliation looks different in those cases, okay? Uh, and and that, that is a, those are horrible situations, they're extreme situations. Some of you, unfortunately, have had to walk through that. So I want to kind of separate what I'm talking about from that. Reconciliation can happen, but it's different here. But, in, in, but for the vast majority of us and the mass, vast majority of our circumstances, we need to give control to God. We need to trust that God's going to work in the life of that person. Joseph didn't know how his brothers were going to respond to his revealing himself to him, to them. But he does because he's trusting God. He says, look, God got me to this point. I see how he's got me in this position to be a blessing. I don't know what he's going to do in my relationship with you, but I want you guys to move here to Egypt. I want my father to come here to Egypt. I'm going to reconcile with you. I'm going to restore my relationship with, 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 with you. This text today that we're looking at serves as a really critical point in the story, the narrative of Joseph's life. Because all the way up to this point, all we see are are, are man and women's actions, what they're deciding to do and how they're choosing to respond and how they're choosing to act. So when Joseph stands up and says this in verse 8 here, it's quite shocking not only to his brothers, but also to us, the readers. He says, you didn't send me here, God sent me here. So the whole narrative is about all the things that people do, but Joseph says, you know what, really who's in charge is God. It's not me. And church, if we're going to win with others, we have to understand that we can't control them, and we can't allow them to control us, but we have to acknowledge that it's God that is ultimately in control. And that means that sometimes we might be like Joseph. We might be stripped of everything and, and found in a pit. We might be sold into into some sort of slavery or end up in a prison. But the point is that God is in control and he's working these circumstances out. Later on, Joseph puts it this way. He says, what you intended for harm, God used 
for good. Joseph accepts God is in control, and he completely relinquishes control to God with these words. So will you be restricted? Will you seek revenge? Or will you work for reconciliation? We've got four different steps for us, and I don't know which step you're on. And, maybe, and I, actually, I would say it's probably not a matter of which one of these four, but it's probably all four of them that we need to do. We need to constantly and actively value others more than ourselves, forgive what we can't forget, give more than we take, and give control to God. Now, here's the beautiful thing about what we're doing today. Today is Communion Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the month. And what better day to talk about these issues, winning with others, when we realize that Christ has won for us, right? Today, we're going to take some time in response to look and talk about the, and remember Christ's sacrifice for us. Because if you think about some of the things that you have done and some of the pain that you have caused the Father, some of the ways that you have broken apart your relationship with God, you've, you've sinned, you've caused uh, animosity between you and God the Father. The beautiful thing about communion is, is it reminds us that God has made a way for us to be in restored relationship with him. God won for us. And so today, I don't know what circumstance maybe you've caused pain in. I don't know what circumstance that's painful that someone else has caused for you. But let's be the kind of people that don't allow it to control us and restrict us. Let's not try to take revenge, but let's seek and work for reconciliation. I have two responses for us today. The first is this. Become a follower of Jesus. Look, if you are not a believer in the room, if you're not a Christian, I'm, I'm sure that you have issues in your life because all of us do. And I'm telling you that the Christian faith has resources for you to find wholeness, to find healing. And when you give control to God, when you become a follower of Jesus, that's when reconciliation and healing can ultimately take place. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to encourage you to take time today to respond. Uh, Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's believing and then it's declaring. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to declare with your hand, not with your mouth, but with your hand. You need to declare with your mouth, but I'm going to ask you to declare with your hand in a moment that you want to accept uh, Christ and become a follower of him. And then second, for those of us who are believers in the room, we need to work for reconciliation. Now, reconciliation does take two parties, but we need to be on the initiative of that. And we need to, on our part, as best as it, as long as it depends on us, to be at peace with everyone and to seek reconciliation. It's not always going to happen, but we need to work for it. We need to work for it. Would you join with me in a word of prayer as our worship team comes? God, today we ask for your help. It's a heavy message. It's a difficult task before us to forgive and to love, to serve and to give. God, because so often we don't want to. Our pain, God, can rule over us. And God, today we want you to rule over us. We want to find wholeness in you. And so help us, God. I, there are probably some people here with some deep Hurt and deep pain. God, heal our wounds, we pray. Restore us, we ask. Maybe we need to forgive someone. Maybe we need to ask for forgiveness of someone. Maybe we need to ask for forgiveness of you. We need to de declare our, our, our desire to follow after you. God, help us today, we pray. Help us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.